joined us in prayer, have joined them. Thank you. Okay, we have spent the last two weeks, and we'll finish tonight, just taking a, a minor overview of this little book, tiny little book, about 80 pages, and um, uh, just focused on the vocal gifts of the Holy Spirit in the church public. So this book is not about uh, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and having uh, your prayer language or anything like that. He references that, but it's not about that. It's about the three vocal gifts of the nine listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This little booklet deals with just three and them being used publicly. Uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. I have about 20 copies of it that I bought for you. If you would like to take one tonight after the service and, and read it and look through it, you're welcome to do that. They're down there on the front row. I didn't get one for everybody uh, because we really aren't going to study it in any more depth. And I didn't get more than that because I wasn't sure how many of you would actually want to check it out. But if you do, it's here, and that's what it's there for. And if once they're gone, if you read it, don't uh, put it on your shelf and forget about it. But if you're done with it, bring it back in or pass it to somebody else in the Wednesday night group, okay? So here's, uh, I'm not going to have a lot of time for your questions because I want to spend 15 minutes just allowing us to seek the Lord. I am, uh, Sister Pam and I have been fasting since Sunday, and so I'm a little, um, I'm a little distracted again tonight. <laughs> uh, I was doing fine until just a little while ago, and it's starting to really, really hit me. And I felt like Sunday afternoon somebody tried to give me a cold, and that thing is just, it's like sitting right in my body saying, the moment you eat, wait until you see what I do. You're going to have misery. I'm going to take your voice away. I've never been through, in all the events I've done for 15 years now, I've never been through what I'm going through this time. Just the attack of the enemy is relentless. For a whole week, about two weeks ago, I was just like, wow, God is so good. This is going to be great. And then about seven, six, seven, eight days ago, it just started. And it was like, there is no God. You're not going to succeed. Everything's going to be a failure. I'm old enough and hopefully wise enough to know what's going on, but it doesn't make it any better. So, uh, anyways. Okay, go in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. Let's, let's just look and figure out what it is that we're talking about. Okay, so from the Scriptures, we're going to go through this first section a little more thoroughly than we have in the other two weeks. Actually, we've been, we've been doing this for many weeks. We talked about the things we believe, and then we segued right into the things we experience. Let love be your highest goal, 1 Corinthians 14, 1. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you'll be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. Now, last week we talked... In first, or excuse me, Acts 19, Paul prayed for some believers, and when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Lord's, the Lord Jesus' baptism, or the promise of the Father, you can call it anything like that you want, they all spoke in tongues with no interpretation. So when you see that and you read this, those can't contradict each other. So he has to be talking here. When he says, I wish you all could, Paul's not saying there's some specialness or there's some limitation. But in the public use of the gift for the whole church, oh yes, there is a limit. Okay? Otherwise, we'd come to church and all 400 people here at Central would all speak in tongues, right? For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. And again, he's got to be talking about public because he's talking about public prophecy. Right? He says one who prophesies 
the whole church is strength. If I'm up here and I'm just knelt down here and I'm saying, God is great, God is moving, God is healing people, God is, and, and I can move into a real prophetic statement, it doesn't benefit any of you because you can't hear it. I'm just up here edifying myself prophetically. Okay? See, so understand, we often say, well, look, the Bible says not everybody speaks in tongues. But it's obvious that he's talking about public because he's talking about public prophecies as well. Sometimes when I'm praying, and I know you're this way too, you're prophesying. You're declaring the good things of God. You're declaring that he's going to heal your, your kid or your grandkid. You're declaring that he's going to prosper you. You're not just saying, God, will you prosper? God, I believe. Brother Ken Gobb was here Sunday. Isn't that what he said? He said, I'm going to just keep declaring the good things of God. Right? Well, that's a personal prophecy. It's in English, but nobody else benefits because it's just the individual person. Verse 5, I wish you all could speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you all, wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. Dear brothers and sisters, if I should come to you speaking in an unknown, unknown language, how would that help you? But if I bring you a revelation or some special knowledge or prophecy or teaching, that will be helpful. Okay, so we're going to go through this list. I put uh, through 7, but I don't really want verse 7. I just wanted through verse 6. So what are three things that we notice? Go back to, I'm in the New Living. So if you have a different translation here, the words might be slightly different or the number of words could be slightly different. But I want you to look there in verse 3. And what do we find as to some of the purposes of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Strengthen, encouragement, comfort. Yeah, in the New Living, strengthens, encourages, and comforts. Right? Now, you'll notice that word in the New Living two more times. Two more times in just the first 10 or 12 verses, strengthens, strengthens. So one of the questions I want us to ask tonight, to ponder, to really get into us is, what are the purposes of these gifts? When you talk about the gift of healing, what's the purpose of the gift of healing? God. Yeah, sure. Ultimately, to glorify God. Uh -huh. To point unbelievers to God, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, but what else? To build faith, to build faith sure. How about to heal a person? <laughs> right? I, I mean, yeah, that's the obvious, right? All of these other things are absolutely right. But the purpose is also very self-evident. The purpose of healing is that somebody would get healed. Yeah. Yeah, so that's important to remember. And we talk about faith as a gift. There are different, faith is explained to us different ways in the New Testament, but one of them is as a gift of faith there in 1 Corinthians 12. A gift of miracles. So what's the purpose? Same thing, glorify God, uh, point the unbeliever to him, build, build our faith. But ultimately it is so that, for example, you have a decision to make. And God gives you his resolution. He gives you his answer. He gives you what he wants you to choose. Now, you may need a gift of faith to hold on to what God gave you. Holding on to what God can give it, and you can struggle to hold on to it. And so faith comes along, a gift of faith for that word, for that direction, for that purpose of God. And God comes along and gives you the ability to believe it, even when others say, well, what are you doing? Well, I I'm going to make this decision. Oh, you're crazy. You can't do that. That won't work. It will work because God told me it will. He's now, not only did he give you the word, he's now giving you the faith to hold on to it. Okay? So these things are kind of self-evident. Faith gives you the ability to have faith. A miracle gives you a miracle. A prophecy. The purpose of prophecy, the purpose of tongues and the interpretation of tongues is what Paul's explaining here. 
because these gifts don't seem quite as self-evident. The intent of the, what is God trying to do? When there's a message in tongues in central assembly, what's God trying to do? Edify the church. church. I'm sorry? Speak Speak to the church. Yep. Encourage the church. Awaken the church. Yeah. So there's a purpose in this. And what sometimes we forget is that the purpose is God's purpose. And we need to merge with that. We need to come into alignment with that. Okay, so I have a quote here for you from Pastor Bullock's book because I, I just think this is helpful. While the general principles of the word give us guidance, it also makes clear that good fruit will be produced in the church by tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. If I am healed, there's a production of good fruit in me. If I go and give, give testimony, if I share with somebody, you will not believe what God did for me. That's good fruit. Well, there should also be good fruit from these vocal gifts. Their effects on the people should be to strengthen, encourage, comfort, and edify them. Uh, the word edify, I think, is what the King James use, uses often in the translation of 1 Corinthians 14. If they tend to beat down, castigate, and upbraid God's people, they are not inspired by the Spirit. They may include correction, because that can strengthen the body of Christ. Even a note of impending judgment may edge in. I like that. But it must not be given with a harshness that implies the speaker is happy about coming doom or thinks his hearers deserve it. Gang, that's not scriptural in the, in the sense that that isn't quoted from the Bible, but that's pretty good stuff there. It's just pretty good Pentecostal common sense. The overall impact of these gifts must always be to build up and strengthen. And so he doesn't deny that these gifts are used by God to do things that, that may not at face value seem totally positive, but they have to be within a boundary that's generally positive. Okay? They have to help us as a church. If they're being used publicly, they have to benefit everybody publicly. Right? So if somebody's healed, it benefits them. If somebody is, um, sees a miracle, it benefits them. But it also benefits the whole church because if it happens in a church service or a crusade, we say, praise God, all glory and praise to God. The same with the vocal gifts. When they are expressed, the intent is that we would all benefit. It's important to remember why we gather. Now, this is not him. The quote is over. Okay, this is me. It's important for us to remember why we gather as believers. We gather to honor Jesus, right? In John 12, too, it's a story of the woman that is going to anoint the feet of Jesus. And uh, the Bible says in verse 2, a dinner was held in his honor. (laughs) That's every church service, gang. That's every time we come together. Tonight, you've come here. Well, you might have kids in the back and you say, well, I might as well just sit out in the sanctuary. I don't have anything else to do. Or you may have come here to see how many eggs we had left to sell. But you should have come here to um, honor Jesus. Some people come here, especially on Sundays, to check a box. You probably check your box with that hand. That's not it. We come into this house to bring honor to Jesus Christ because he is worthy of it. We had a great video today at uh, Cleansing Stream. Um, Pastor Pete, where are you at? Are you up there? Okay. I, can't, I can see somebody. But um, was that, what would you call that? A rap? Spoken word? Spoken word. Yeah. A rhyming. I don't know if you're familiar with that a lot, but it's much more popular in the church than it's ever been. And uh, boy, he was really good. What was his name? I don't remember. Do you? I put it in my mind to remember. And But the whole thing really honored Jesus. And so he was in front of a big screen, and everything he said formed words behind him. And then at the end, the camera panned back, and all those words formed the name of Jesus. They had done the artwork in such a way. It was really, really well done. But it was to bring honor to him. That's the purpose, really, of every service. And so when we say that, 
uh, dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. From the moment we depart our homes for the gathering until we have returned, this is to be our motivation. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us the ability to do this. The Holy Spirit gets you out of your house into God's house. The Holy Spirit is here with us while we're in God's house, and the Holy Spirit gets you home. It's the same Holy Spirit who by his very presence flowing, this is a word that we use, and we really can't define it, but you know it when it's happening. When the Holy Spirit is flowing in us and between us, yeah, we often talk about Jesus moving through us when we're trying to minister to somebody, to witness to them. But here in the church, the Holy Spirit is flowing between us. He's connecting us. He's, he's knitting us together into the fabric of that tapestry that only the Lord can fabricate. And as he does that, he brings a oneness in. Sometimes I'm sitting on a platform in another country and they're talking another language and all of a sudden I know exactly what they're saying. I don't mean I know it in my brain. I don't mean it's an interpretation of what they're saying. I just know because of the flow. I know what they're doing. They're moving into God's presence. They're doing something. I was telling somebody the other day, uh, I, I don't like to even confess this, but everywhere I've been in the world, I can enjoy the worship except Pakistan. They, their music is unlike any of our music styles. It's not country, it's not rock, it's not uh, jazz. It, I don't, it's just, if you heard like Indian and Pakistani music, it's more, very, it seems very mournful. And they play these weird instruments, very weird instruments. The one is a, like a mini organ uh, accordion, and they're pumping it and playing it. It's like a and yeah, and so I have to sit there and say, Jesus, they tell me this is about you. In Africa, man, I'm with them. I, some, I know some of the Swahili words and same in Spanish. I'm just all in it. And you can just see it, hear it, and feel it. It sounds a little bit like our music, and so I go with it. But uh, these guys, man, I just have to close my eyes and say, okay, whatever. And then I just begin to believe, Jesus, you're doing something. And it's amazing that if I step into the flow when it's my time, my time to do what I do, they've done what they do, and, and it's worship, then the flow is still there. I don't have to understand it, and I don't have to feel it. It makes, it makes it a lot easier if I do, but there's that connection. The Holy Spirit's connecting it. He's the one orchestrating it. And when you look at John 12, you can see that um, in the woman that comes to, to anoint the feet of Jesus. If you see her as the Holy Spirit, you'll get what I'm talking about. Okay. <clears throat> it's the same Holy Spirit who by his very presence flowing in us and between us has an overall plan for every service. It's our responsibility to work within this flow, to be sensitive to it, and to desire others to sense it as well. This flow will always lead to Jesus. It will always be scriptural since he is the word. It will illuminate since he is the light. You could go on and on with that. But when you come to church, it should be, you should have two desires, that I would be in the flow of what the Holy Spirit's doing and that I would encourage others. I would help others. I would make it possible for others to be in that flow. Amen? Otherwise, we become an obstacle and a hindrance. The gifts are always about Jesus, but we are occasionally not. Would you agree? Even in church, sometimes I'm not about Jesus. For this reason, the expression of the gifts is sometimes less than glorious, and especially when we talk about tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. We want them to be uh, you know, mountaintop experiences, but sometimes they are a little bit less than that. The Spirit is certainly not to blame. When his flowing presence has been contradicted. This is one of the reasons the scriptures require us to hold each other accountable in the use of the gifts of the Spirit. Because we don't, we, we don't want, um, like rarely, I've got it in here in a minute, it rarely is it in a Spirit-filled church do we have to worry about the counterfeit. I, we're always sensitive to that, but listen, it's very hard for the devil to get a tool, a vessel, into a spirit-filled service and then be able to get that vessel to speak up. And that's a sign, gang. That's a cool sign. It's just rare. Almost unheard of. Now, you can go out in the world and find them 
talking in the tongues of the devil all the time. Some of the movies that have done it over the years. Um, Robert De Niro, Cape Fear. If you watch it, I haven't seen it in 25 or 30 years, but he'll speak in tongues in it. And you can tell. Ah. <laughs> if you're spirit filled, you can say, whoa, uh, nice try, but not even close. Um, Aladdin, who played the genie? Robin Williams. Yep. And you hear it and you say, whoa. Now, some of you have that at home on VHS. And you're going to go home tonight and say, where's our VHS player? I got I to see what Pastor was talking about. And he'll do it in there. And let me just encourage you as believers, don't ever mock the Holy Spirit. Not cool at all. You want to get sideways with God in a hurry, just mock him. Um, anyways, he does that in there. There are others out there. And you can uh, see it. I mean, they're trying to be funny. They're trying to be this, that, or the other. But in the church, to get those guys to come into this building in the midst of one of our spirit-filled services and pop off with something like that, hmm, not too easy. And uh, thank the Lord for it. So is there room for error when the expression of the gifts appears, of the gift appears, or feels just a little off? Absolutely. We want to make room here at Central for all of us to learn from what is happening and to grow in our understanding and maturity as a result. Rarely are these three gifts used that I've ever experienced when I thought they were absolutely perfect. And that includes when I was involved in these gifts. These are challenging gifts. When you pray for somebody and they get healed, you say, oh, that was a gift of healing. Thank the Lord. Easy peasy, over and done. But when there's a utterance, an, an utterance, a prophetic word, ooh, not quite so easy peasy, is it? Because we're involved, right? Here are a few examples. Here are a few examples of when I, I'm talking personally here, might be put in the place of needing to bring public correction in the use of the gifts. So timing. When we talk about the flow of the Holy Spirit, one of the big issues is timing. A gift should not interrupt the invitation of a response to Jesus. Uh, that's just me. If I'm given an altar call, don't give a message in tongues. It's just not good. All right? I'm going to run you over. And if somebody else is up here giving an altar call, you're not going to see me. I told you this a few weeks ago. You're not going to see me run them over. It just won't happen. Uh, for me, that's the most sacred moment of anything. When Jesus is using anybody, hopefully bypassing them and just saying to people, come to me. Right? So timing is a big deal. And then there's other aspects of the timing as well. You know, I try most Sundays, you're going you're gonna to see me. You may not know it. You may not think I'm doing anything. But you're going to see me give a pause at a specific time or make sure that my mouth isn't running or that I'm not in the middle of anything so that if the Holy Spirit wants to use a gift like that, there's room for it. But those aren't the only gifts I'm looking for on a Sunday or Wednesday. I'm still looking for the gift of healing. I'm looking for the gift of discerning of spirits. I'm looking for the gift of faith. Okay, subject. Even though a gift is of the spirit, a word of prophecy or tongues with interpretation is not intended to bring correction to the church. Now here's why. You can't bring correction to the church unless you're willing to be responsible before God for your correction. It's the worst part of what I live with, but knowing that I'm going to answer to God for everything that I teach you, everywhere I take you, and when we talk about bringing correction to the church, notice what he said, and I liked it. There's room for edging over into this, but it's got to be positive, and so it can't be uh, condemning. We can't be happy about it when God uses us to speak of, a, of an in, impending judgment. You know, there's no place for us to be happy about that or say, oh, that's because you deserve it. Uh, okay, and then finally, uh, oh, and I put in there, a better way to approach this. If you feel this church needs correction, you need to meet privately with the pastor and review with him or her the needed correction for the church. Several years ago, four or more, we were in a prayer meeting here, a uh, prayer service. And um, there was a visitor, and this visitor began to bring forth a prayer, 
you know, loud enough, stood up, and I think came to the microphone and prayed. And uh, as it went along, it went from uh, pretty positive to pretty negative and became very uh, corrective for this church. Now, the microphone was either here or here, and the person was standing, and I was knelt within about seven feet of the person. And so I looked up because I thought, okay, you need to see who I am and what I'm feeling about this because I have to answer for God for what you're trying to tell us here. And so I finally had to step up and say, um, um, let's be careful about how we're doing this. And then we talked afterwards. I forget this person was related to somebody in our church. And in the days to follow was extremely receptive to why I was concerned. It was very mature in how they handled my concern. Praise God. This person felt like they had just got captivated by the moment and the intensity. I'll tell you something that can happen. You can get a hold of a microphone and be on a platform and you feel differently because of the atmosphere that you're in. And you, you and I can, I can certainly make mistakes. Okay, and then number three, source. What is the source? And that's where I talk to you about the fact that rarely is the source the enemy here at church. Our goal is always to lift up Jesus Christ the King. Our purpose is always to be a conduit for others to do the same and never to be a hindrance. Okay, who has a question tonight or a comment? Question or comment? I'm cold, I'm hungry, <laughs> tired. <laughs> oh, it's perfect. Hallelujah. Perfect teaching. Wonderful. Ah, Pastor Pete just texted me. Clayton Jennings. Clayton Jennings. Maybe we'll show that. We might show that at Easter. Just like as a build up to the service. It was, it was pretty good. Really good, really. Uh, I thought. Next week, uh, for the next couple of weeks, Pastor Adam will be uh, leading you. I've asked Sister Sherry to take a couple of Wednesdays in April and Sister Linda Sandemeyer to take a couple of Wednesdays in April as well because I want to sit and hear from somebody else just like you are. So as we close this out, questions? Comments? Oh, I thought you'd have questions about the gifts especially the gifts of tongues, interpretation, tongues, and prophecy? Yes, Sister Amy. Um, have you ever experienced Yes. And he addresses that at the end of the book in a significant way. And he even has some uh, suggested statements that the pastor can make. Hey, we love the gifts. We welcome the gifts here. And um, this is why God says if you're going to give a message in tongues, you should also be praying that if, I'm going to add a little bit to the scripture here, if no one else is present who interprets it or has the gift of interpretation, you should be prepared to do that. And that's the reason I feel a lot of people don't want to be involved in these gifts because they're afraid that once they give their part, nothing will happen and it'll make them look bad or foolish. And, and I understand that. One of the things that you have to know is <clears throat> I try to always be prepared. I don't want to be used in those vocal gifts because everybody hears from me enough. But I try to always be prepared that if I feel like the Lord wants to use me or um, I would prefer not to have a message in tongues with no interpretation. And if a message comes I am 99.9% .9 sure there's going to be an interpretation. Okay? Yeah. Sister Pam and I go through this all the time. Go ahead. Right. I try to get better at how I guide those things. I'm trying to learn and grow. And uh, thank you, Sister Pam, because that, that is one of the things that I try to do. 
he makes the point in here that those are what we would now call teachable moments. And I've always taken that position as well. Uh, we're not perfect at these gifts. These are the ones I think that are the most subject to our humanity. They're the most subject to our interjection. And they have to come through us. They do. Otherwise, it'd just be the heavens would open and God would speak from, uh, from heaven as a voice. And that'd be fine. But that's not the way he chooses. And I think part of the reason that he gives these gifts is so that we will fight through the anxiety to be used, fight through the fear, the, um, the self-judgment, and, and, and participate. And let me just encourage you, just the same as receiving the baptism, being used in these gifts requires you to step into that first word or first syllable. You may feel that you have an interpretation or you may not. And again, don't hear it central. Generally speaking, you should not worry about that. If you feel that you're to be used in a message of tongues, then do it. And you let me worry about the rest. It's part of what I'm supposed to do. Sister Jane? Yeah, the interpretation. Yeah, and, and that's what, what Paul gets at there in chapter 14. So there is, th this might be the most burdensome of the gifts, the gift of a message in tongues, because you do have to be uh, prepared to, to go further, and that can be intimidating. Or as Sister Pam says, sometimes other people have it, but they don't want to be used in it. And especially in a church our size, there can be the sense that, well, everybody's looking at me. If I make a mistake, everybody's going to judge me, and, and um, it's going to be on Facebook later today. And Yeah, all, all of that is true, but I don't want you to be limited by fear. Because God gives us these gifts, and I think part of the reason he gives them is so that we have another challenge, another reason to say, oh, God, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here, but can, I don't know if you can use me or not. And that's how he wants us to stay in that tension with him, you know, that tension. Like, I don't think he can use me. What if God does use me? I don't know if it's me or somebody else. And that tension is, is important. And in that, you just simply say to the Holy Spirit, I'm here and I'm available. And uh, how do you know? Well, you'll get this, I think, real sense. Again, the service will come to a place where there's an opportunity for you. I think before the service, you've had some inkling. You've been at a place with God in the hours leading up to the service where you have a, an awareness that he's going to be doing something special. It may just be in the moments of the opening of the service, the worship, but you just know. And then there's this um, understanding inside of you that something is to be spoken, and it's the Holy Spirit that does that understanding. Beyond that, gang, it's faith. You just got to step into it, and that's pretty intimidating. And I think that's why some of us who work in public ministry are more comfortable with some of those public gifts because it's not a big stretch. I'm already talking, you know. But for those who rarely say anything inside this building, it, it can be really tough to, for God. Great point. Great question, Sister Amy. And there are many churches, and he references that in the book, many churches do that with prophecy. I'll tell you what, many churches will require both. So in other words, if you're there before any vocal gift can be exercised, somebody has to be told. Usually they have some um, older believers, elders, or deacons, 
and you'll tell them and they will tell the pastor, hey, this person has, feels like God wants to use them. And he has a whole chapter in there about, well, doesn't that take away kind of the, the anointing part of it and the surprise part of it? But uh, it seems like if it's God and it's that important, that God won't mind us going through some channels to make sure, number one, maybe we want that person to have a microphone so everybody can hear. In a church our size, that's a challenge, right? Um, but I think that here at Central, we're not at that point. Um, you'll, if you watch me on the platform when I think it's that point, um, I'm watching every corner of this building. You notice it doesn't have any corners. Uh, but I can tell you that I'm seeing everything. And I may not know who that person is, but I think if they are not a part of this church, I'm going to be on really high alert. If they're a part of this church, I trust them. I do. I, I trust them. And even if I need to say, mm, okay, um, years ago I, I sat somebody down and heard about that for a long time. But um, they were wrong. You know, these gifts are not infallible. They, they can be used improperly. And it just, it wasn't working. I'd already warned the Sunday before, but everybody forgets that. The Sunday before, the person, the first time here, did what they did the first time. And I gave a tiny little nudge of, of not correction, but just guidance. And the next week, ran right over my guidance and threw it back in my face. Ha! <laughs> yeah, that's not, don't do that. All right, don't throw it back in my face because it's going to come right back at you. And in this building, I have a lot more authority than anybody else, right? But by and large, it's not the authority that I have. It's the responsibility that I have. So I'm listening, and, I'm, and how am I judging, and how am I measuring? That's what I'm looking for. Does this fit in the flow of what's going on? Does this edify us and strengthen us and encourage us? Prophetically, we typically think of prophecy as speaking about unknown things and often about future things. But uh, it doesn't have to be that. And so I think any time we have a spoken word within the congregation that happens in that moment in the service, we would say, well, that was a prophetic word, even if it doesn't talk about the future. But um, these things are, are not easy, but here we try to make room for them, even on Sunday mornings. Lots of Pentecostal churches, they forbid it on Sunday mornings. But we try to make room for it. And yes, same as with tongues, you find that place in the service where it fits. You know that God's been dealing with you about it. Your life, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be sinless. But living in sin won't cut it. <laughs> okay? I'm going to say that again. You don't have to be perfect, and we certainly don't expect you to be sinless. But living in sin, how do you define the difference in those two? I don't know, but you'll know. Right? We just know. Uh, living in sin, if we know you're living in sin and you're also lecturing us, that's going to be difficult. We're, we're not going to take that very well. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, the prophetic is much the same. You have to have faith. You have to step into it. I'll tell you what else I'm looking for is confidence. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense and reward. And, and what you sense is when that person, boom, when they start, they know. They know as much as anybody else knows. Oh, God's, God's doing something here. Now, is God himself speaking through you, the Holy Spirit? Yes. Is, he's, he's vocalizing the intent of God, the mind of God. But it comes through us. Aren't you glad it's in English? The interpretation or the prophetic word is in English, right? So it comes it doesn't come in Chinese or it doesn't come in Russian. It comes in English. So God wants us to know what he's feeling, thinking, and seeing among us. Okay, we're going to take a few minutes and, uh, and, and, and just worship. I want you to make that kind of a commitment to the Lord tonight. Uh, I, I'm not asking for the gifts to operate. I'm, uh, I'm asking for you tonight to take the time to say, Lord, I'm starting to see. I'm getting it. And if you want to use me in these vocal gifts in my home church, so I don't encourage you to be used in the gifts when you're in another church. That's, that's not your church. But when you're in your church and God wants to use you, I want you to feel comfortable to do that. Okay? That doesn't mean we need seven tongues interpretations every Sunday, but we want people to be free to move into God. Come on, stand with me tonight.
if you'd like to. And Brother Ricky is just going to lead us in a chorus, a worship time here. And then I'm going to try and figure out what it is I think God wants.